Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. It's our honor to have Professor Yu Wing Mai as a special guest and visiting professor, senior visiting professor of IAS, who is giving a seminar this afternoon. Professor Yu Wing Mai did undergraduate as well as postgraduate at the University of Hong Kong with a uh, PhD degree in 1969, okay. 40 years ago. <laughs> Do I look that old? <laughs> Many of you were not born there. From, from mechanical engineering at Hong Kong University of, uh, sorry, Hong Kong University. <laughs> University of Hong Kong. He has been working at quite a few other institutions after his graduation. He spent some time in the UK, Imperial College, in the US, University of Michigan, and also NIST, National Institute of Science and Technology at various times. And of course, in Hong Kong, many times, at UST and City University, and Hong Kong Polytechnic University, as well as University of Hong Kong, who is, which is his alma mater. Um, Professor Mai is quite well known and international authority in fracture and fatigue and advanced materials and composite. He certainly is quite prolific in his publication, if I remember correctly, at least 750 journal papers in the last 40 years. Um, most notably, he also published seven books, yep. <laughs> seven also books, not proceedings, but also books. He is currently, he has been elected to memberships and fellowships of six academies in the world, including Royal Society London, UK um, Academy of Engineering, Royal Academy of Engineering, sorry, and Australian Academy of Science, Australian Academy of Science and Technology Engineering yeah. as well. And not to mention Hong Kong Academy of Science, Engineering Science, sorry. And uh, most recently he's been elected to 40 member of Chinese of Academy of Engineering. Without uh, further ado, and um, he's going to, to uh, give a talk on thermal conductive ma composite materials as on the field materials for electronic packaging. Please welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Django. And uh, it's always a delight to be back here in uh, Hong Kong, USD. And uh, uh, I suppose some of you knew that I uh, was a member of staff in the department, then the mechanical engineering department, now renamed mechanical and aerospace engineering in the early 90s. And uh, so to, uh, uh, I visited here quite a number of times. So I have seen a lot of changes on campus. And I have also seen that the department, the old department of mechanical engineering, uh, certainly has evolved to be one of the very best in the world. And uh, I, uh, uh, so very delighted to be back here. Uh, as uh, Professor Kim mentioned, uh, I started work uh, on uh, fracture mechanics. And that is where I received my uh, basic training in mechanics uh, at the University of Hong Kong. Um, so mechanics is not a uh, very popular topic of research now these days. So you have to really uh, try to change your research directions. So about 10 years ago, I mean, I have changed to working on polymer nanocomposites. And as a consequence of that, so in the last five years 
or thereabout. Uh, I have uh, worked with my uh, uh, close colleagues in uh, HUSD, Hua Zhong Li Gong in Wuhan, on a very different topic, and that is the subject of what I'm going to talk about. And that is on the thermal conductive polymer composites. Particularly, we use it for uh, underfills in electronic packaging. And this work, as I explained earlier to David Lam, was supported by a large international project between uh, uh, Sydney and also. So this, this project was mainly supported uh, by uh, the uh, uh, National Science Foundation of China, uh, between uh, myself and uh, Professor Xu Xiaolin, who is now uh, the vice president uh, at uh, HUSD. And uh, this was a five-year project, and it was just finished uh, last year, and the final uh, report was done in May this year. Oh. Okay, now the IC industry and particularly in electronic packaging, to many of you would know what it is about. And uh, this involves the design, the manufacturing, and the packaging aspects. And if you look at the proportion of packaging overall of this cake, it's around about 44%. And the production value in China last year that the number I got is around about 62 or 63 billion RMB. So that is quite a large market. And if you look at the IC packaging development over the years, I remember when in the 1990s, when I actually joined the when I actually joined this department, right in this 1990 area, the surface mount technology was the most popular. And if you remember CT, Matthew Yun at that time uh, was working primarily on electronic packaging, but on the surface mount technology. And then uh, Bill Chan from the IBM was talking about the roadmap of packaging. So those were the days when this department was involved in the very, very early work. And I note subsequently, Professor Kim and Professor uh, 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 Ricky Lee, as well as uh, Wu Jinsung, they all are involved in this particular area, certain aspect of this area. So this is more or less a map showing the development of electronic packaging and uh, this is where we are now. It is basically looking at the chip scale package. So, and further on, of course, is now the 3D vertical type of uh, packaging. And we today will be focused primarily on this here, on the uh, flip chip packaging. Uh, okay, don't get used to this one. Okay. The simple explanation to those who are not familiar with this particular aspect, and this slide shows what we are really trying to do. You have your chip here, and then you have your uh, 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 shoulder joints. These are the shoulders. And of course, in the uh, 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 10 years or there about ago, we are always talking about lat three shoulders. Uh, but basically, the shoulders resting on which would be the chip, and then connecting to the substrate. So the main problems are with the thermal cycling, the thermal residual stresses that would be imposed on the components. And the main reason for that is because of the difference in the thermal uh, uh, expansion uh, mismatch. So you will see that the difference between uh, the, uh, the chip, the, surf, uh, the soda joints, and the substrate that causes these uh, 
thermocycling. And as a result of the thermocycling, you will have the fracture of the soda joints. So uh, another of my uh, a former research fellow called Zhang Xingping, who is now in the Walan Li Gong, and he has been working is primarily now on the problem of so-called nanomaterials for soda joints, and is looking at the stresses and how these uh, actually affect the integrity of the material. So in the underfill, what, what, what do you mean by underfill? Here explains uh, what the process of underfilling is. And there are generally uh, three packaging processes. The first one is the most used one, which is the capillary-driven underfill. And it's around about 60% of all the three types that are used. So essentially, what you have is that you have the resin. Uh, OK, the only thing is this is not very good. In the, OK, you have your underfill material, the chip above, the soda joints, and then the substrate. And that the gap between the chip and the substrate is when you put the liquid, when you put the resins in, it sucks it up by capillary forces to fill the gap. And that is the underfilling process. So what kind of material you're going to put in is the most important thing for thermal management. Now, there are other two techniques, which is basically the so-called the molded uh, underfill. So you inject all these uh, uh, underfill there, and then you just do it by thermal uh, 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 heating. And that is the third uh, technique as well. So the most common technique is the top one, and that is the one we are talking about today here. Hmm. Yeah, this one. No, this one is the in the pointer. No. Forward. Oh, forward, yeah. I think maybe running out of battery soon, is it? This the forward, backward, right? Yeah. This, this one is forward. Forward, no, I know. Now this one is backward, but it doesn't go backward. See? It doesn't go backward. <laughs> ah, go to here. No. Oh, use the keyboard. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> OK. <laughs> OK, all right. All right, OK. All right. Uh, yeah, OK. Uh, the, the basic uh, re requirements for the underfill uh, packaging uh, process uh, I have briefly uh, uh, summarized them to, uh, over here. And uh, we look at the high performance and high reliability of electronic devices. And the main point is really you've got to look at the mechanical, the thermal, the electrical, and the processing uh, requirements for the underfill materials. So, for reliability requirements, you need to have low CTEs, and you need to have high uh, 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 TGs, which is roughly about 120 uh, degrees centigrade and above. And for the integration requirements, you need to have high thermal conductivity. And the only difference between TIM, thermal interface uh, 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 materials, as opposed to the underfill, is you need to have electrical insulation. Then uh, the filling, the, the capillary drawing process, you need to have low viscosity. And for signal processing and all this, you need to have low dielectric constant and dielectric loss. So in other words, you need to satisfy all these requirements. And the requirements, the new numbers I put down there, high thermal conductivity, meaning bigger than about one to watt uh, per meter degrees uh, Kelvin. Viscosity got to, got to be less than 20 centipoise. And uh, 
and so forth. All right? So these are the conditions. So when you look at what is available in terms of the uh, 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 fillers, and you will see in this table that uh, the epoxy value is round about 0 0.14 to 0 0.2. And then you have the, 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 the inorganic uh, materials. And then uh, you have the uh, very high uh, TC thermal conductivity value material, silver, and the uh, 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 carbon nanotubes, etc. Now, these are the ideal uh, materials to get high thermal conductivity. But the problem with that is with, you need to get quite a large amount of these loading into the epoxy in order to get to the required thermal conductivity. And as a consequence of that, you will have a lot of problems. Is that you need to make sure that they are electrical insulated, which by this alone were not. And then you need to have to reduce the interface uh, uh, thermal resistance and reduce the viscosity. And certainly, when you have a high loading of the fillers, the viscosity would be high. And that is no good. OK, now there are some early attempts to try to use some of these fillers. For example, what we have put here is thermal conductivity against the filler volume. Now, if you want to satisfy the thermal conductivity requirement, then you need to go to about 30% loading. And if you look at the the, this here, you will see that probably for boron nitride, you can satisfy this thermal conductivity requirement at 30 volume percent. And also, you can satisfy the uh, 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 coefficient of thermal expansion. There's no doubt that you can satisfy these two requirements if you can have 30% of the boron nitride added into the epoxy. But at 30%, you will see that the viscosity is just too high. And there's no way that you can process them. So that is the main problem. OK. Here is just a sketch of what people have really attempted to solve these uh, thermal conductivity problem over maybe the last five to 10 years. And uh, there are a number of ways you can do it. And uh, you can control, for example, the filler geometry, the filler dispersion, the interface conductance, and also forming the thermal conductive network. So there are ways we can look at. The first one is basically to look at the particles, whether they are uh, uh, 1D, 0D, or 2D, or, or whatever, and what are the aspect ratios. And the second one is the filler distribution is whether they are aggregated or not aggregated. And the interface, uh, uh, thermal interface uh, resistance or conductance uh, is really an important uh, factor because you don't want the phonons to scatter. And, and uh, this is basically to make use the combination of 0D, 1D, 2D to provide a better conducting path. So in the following slides, we will try to give an attempt of what we had done in the past five years to achieve some of these uh, 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 criteria for uh, the uh, packaging uh, underfield material. OK, now the first one, which I think everybody knows, to reduce the, 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 the uh, full-on scatter is essentially to try to reduce the elastic mismatch, the elastic modulus mismatch. Now, if you look at the, scheme, the schematic here, you will see that this is the polymer matrix. Now, normally for electronic packaging, we're looking at epoxy. It's around about 3 gigapascal. And uh, unless you're looking at even higher temperature aerospace application, you won't be looking at beyond epoxy. You go, in those cases, you might be looking at uh, poly-EMI, which is higher temperature. 
And then uh, this is, if you look, at, you use the graphene or CNT material, you can see that there's a huge gap in the elastic modulus. So that is no good. So quite often, we try to add an interface layer there. And this green one is the inorganic uh, 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 layer. You can add between the two. So therefore, you try to actually temper the gradient and to reduce the scatter. So uh, uh, the first one that we did many years ago is to try to make use of these idea to, 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 to coat onto uh, the carbon nanotubes a layer of the silica. Silica is somewhere here. Uh, uh, yeah, silica is somewhere here, all right? So what we basically do is to try to coat a silica layer onto the CNT and to make them insulating and yet thermally conducting. So uh, we look at uh, this uh, first method we did. So that is the first way that we try to insulate uh, the uh, 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 CNTs and yet to try to get an improvement in the thermal conductivity. So here is simply a sketch of what we do using saw gel techniques to coat silica onto the uh, carbon nanotubes. And uh, the, 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 the coating thickness is around about 20 nanometer. And the, here is a sketch of what we, what we did. And then if you look at the thermal conductivity on the left and electrical resistance on the right, you will see that epoxy, niche epoxy, the thermal conductivity is very low. And the electrical resistivity is very high. But now you will put just one, say here is uh, 0.5 weight percent of the uh, CNT into the epoxy. You, of course, will improve its uh, thermal, conduct uh, the, the, the thermal conductivity. But its electrical resistance will come down. You want to expect it. However, you will try to coat this with a, SI, a silica layer, because being a, uh, electrically insulating, you will see that the thermal conductivity goes up, and so, so is the thermal resistance. So in other words, you can change, of course, the amount of the, 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 the uh, 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 CNT to so add to the matrix. You can therefore here achieve pretty good uh, 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 conduct thermal conductivity and also pretty good insulating properties. Having said that, though, the, uh, the number that you get for the thermal conductivity is not very high. It's basically around about 0 0.3 or 0 0.25 or something. So it's much less than this. So that hasn't satisfied uh, what uh, we really need. And that was a first attempt many years ago when uh, the, the student uh, spent about a year in my lab. But, she, uh, but he went on to do some more work. So the next thing we try is the following. And that is to make use of silver lander wires. Now the silver lander wires, we did not buy it in the market. We basically synthesized them to make them cheap. Otherwise, it's not worth uh, a, 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 the try. And essentially, it's the same technique. We coat silica layer to make it insulating. And again, it's about 20, 25 nanometer uh, thick. And now, the principle is still the same. The silica layer is in the middle. And then your silver nanowire here. And then that is epoxy. So that really serves as an intermediate layer to moderate the elastic mismatch of the modulus. Now, by doing this, you actually will be able now to look at the viscosity. These are the silver nanowires, but then they are added with different amounts, 0.5% to 4% of the silica-coated silver nanowires. Now, we say that you need to have about 20 centipoles in order to float easily by capillary forces. Here, they are all lower than uh, 20. So that means the flow, the flowability is not an issue. And if you look at these, you go to about 4 volume percent, then you will see that it is coated with the silica, then you get about 
maybe 1.1. So in this case, you can satisfy the requirement of viscosity for processing and also the thermal conductivity of bigger than one. The only problem is the mechanical properties are not particularly good. So we then try to see if we can uh, resolve this problem. OK, then the here is a slightly different approach. We still use silver lander wires. But the way to improve the mechanical properties of the matrix, the epoxy, uh, have been, there have been a lot of work established up to, uh, before. If you use silica into the uh, epoxy, you can improve its mechanical properties. So that's what we have been doing for many years. And if you look at this sketch here, you will see that this is actually the microstructure of a, an epoxy, which is filled with the nano silica. So the silica is very well distributed within the matrix, and it guarantees you you can have good mechanical properties in terms of modular strength, etc. Now, to in order to achieve this, what we have done is to look at the silver nano wire again, but the silver nano wire is coated with PVP. And because of the PVP can interact uh, with, uh, actually, uh, the uh, uh, silver nanowire uh, 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 hydroxyl uh, uh, groups through this so-called hydrogen bonding, as well as the winter wild forces which want the nanowire, silver nanowire, and the silica nanoparticles, we can actually formed a uniform structure of the matrix filled with the silica. At the same time, the silver nano wires can also be decorated or attracted all the silica nanoparticles to its circumference, and therefore making it insulating. And, and the following picture shows you what we do, OK? Now, if you look at from the left, there is uh, 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 just pure uh, silver lander wires. But if you move to the right, B, C, and D, we will have increasing amount of 5 weight percent, the nano silica, 10 and 15 weight percent. So here, this shows the attraction because of the PVP interacting with the uh, hydroxyl group of the of the silica uh, 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 lando particles, they begin to be drawn along the length. So therefore, this is more or less coated with a, a silica lando layer. That means this is providing the electrical insulation. Now, if we do a ultra thin sectioned uh, TEM, uh, this so schematically here. The silver lano wire in green, uh, 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 indicated by the green arrow, and the sil silica lano particles that are uniformly deposited onto the surfaces. But at the same time, the matrix, they are filled with the nano silica. So that means this is what we want good insulation, good thermal conductivity, and good mechanical properties. So this is very useful. Now, there are certainly other factors that we have to consider. So that is ours. Uh, oh, before I do that, OK, we'll show you why uh, there are problems, uh, why the mechanical properties were not good in the beginning. See, uh, blah, 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 A, that means there is no silica nanoparticles. So you see the silver nanowires just accumulated into a cluster. So the mechanical properties, the thermal properties, will not be very good. Even at uh, 5 weight percent, again, you still have some clusters of the silver nano wires. Now you go to higher, like 10 and 15 weight percent, now you can see these are the coated silver nano wires which are sticking out. So this is the structure to give you good strength and good electrical and thermal uh, properties. 
OK, now what about the viscosity? Now you will see here, this is some, a, a plot on, the, on, on your left hand side. The viscosity plotted against the shear rate. And you will see that these are for, OK, this was for epoxy. And these are successively for different amounts of the silica nanoparticles there. And the black one represents the one with 15 weight percent. Now, there is a range by which you can satisfy this 20 centipoise requirement. So you need to apply the correct shear rate when you rely on the drawing of the liquid into the gap of the chip between the chip and the, and the substrate. So that means we can, we can actually achieve that if we choose the right composition. OK. Now here is just a schematic to show that the thermal conductivity is on, on, on the left. And uh, epoxy is around about 0.2. Epoxy with silica alone, not much better. Epoxy with a silver nanowire but not coated, not very good, is 4, 4, 4, 4 volume percent. Then if you have the epoxy filled with silica, nanowire, and uh, a silver nanowire and a silica, you get around about 1.1. And your enhancement, thermal enhancement factor is around about 400%. So that is quite, quite enormous. Now what about the electrical uh, properties? Now here is really uh, 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 the plot of epoxy, 5 weight percent sil silica nanoparticles, right to 15. Now here, that means it is not conducting. Uh, this is electrical resistance. So, so the horizontal curves here are not conducting. Now, if you have just epoxy, or you only have 5 weight percent of the silica nanoparticles, but 4% of the silver nanowire, they become conducting. At 4 volume percent of silver nanowire, they are conducting. So that is no good. So you have to, you, the reason is very simple. It's because the silica layer is not able to fully cover the wire. So therefore, you will have electrical resistance. So you need to have around about 10 to 15 weight percent to bring it up, bring it back to here, so that it's electrically insulating. So it seems that silver nanowires at 4 volume percent plus about 10 to 15 weight percent of the silica uh, nanoparticles, we can satisfy viscosity, thermal conductivity, electrical conductivity, and good mechanical properties. So that is not bad. All right. Now, in those cases, the three cases we talk about, we are only working on more or less a single, single uh, 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 filler. Uh, there are ways that you can actually make them more thermally conductive. And certainly, Professor Kim has done some of this work some years back. Uh, but let me just tell you what we, we did here. OK. They compare with the single fillers, the hybrid fillers, that is a mixture of 0 plus 1 or 1, 0 plus 2 or whatever mixture of the different fillers in different dimensions you can actually provide a much more efficient uh, 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 network for thermal uh, uh, transport. And you can also have good mechanical properties. Now, the one we just talked about is similar to here, except that this is a thermally conductive uh, 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 filler, but we do, we do not uh, talk about insulation here yet. But in principle, it's similar to this. The zero D would be the, the silica nanoparticles. And then zero D plus two D, two D can be graphene or, 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 or something, right? And then this is one D plus two D. Now, uh, OK, so I showed you. All right, so this is what uh, Professor Xi uh, did uh, uh, pretty, pretty recently. The, the whole idea is to 
look at silver nanoparticles as the uh, uh, zero D filler, but that is acting for the purpose of uh, reducing the contact uh, resistance, which you want uh, here is the uh, boron nitride and uh, uh, but between different sheets of boron nitride. So what we did here basically is the following. Okay, you started with hexagonal boron nitride, and then uh, we have uh, uh, do the ball milling in uh, urea. The urea is really to provide the NH2 group for reaction with epoxy. And to here, then after the ball milling, you will have the so-called uh, H aminylated BNNS, that is the formation of the NH2 group. And then here, through the reduction of silver nitrate and this, um, you will get the silver nanoparticles, which are decorated just like this, all right, onto the fat sheet. And then you add it to epoxy, and then you mix and cure. Now, this is the final product that you can get. You got epoxy, you got the, 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 the boron uh, uh, elytra nanosheets uh, decorated uh, with the silver nanoparticles. And now, now you can actually uh, apply a sintering or a kneading process around about 310 minutes. And that is to allow the particles, the silver nanoparticles, to actually bond together as a connection between the individual uh, sheets. And in this way, then you can improve the properties. And the schematic is on here. So the purple ones are essentially uh, the silver uh, uh, particles. And there are some also decorated onto the sheet. And this forms a three-dimensional network, and uh, these are just uh, based on this effective medium theory to calculate what would be the thermal conductivity if you were to have different uh, contact resistance. And so these dotted lines in different colors correspond to different uh, contact resistance values. And these red and, uh, and, uh, and, the, and the dark uh, uh, data points represent uh, the uh, uh, epoxy filled with a silver nanoparticle decorated uh, nanosheets before and after uh, the uh, 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 sintering. So you will see these data points experimentally are above the ones without sintering. And the sintering is actually just like here, to bring the sheets together, to reduce the contact resistance. All right, now, now if, uh, I, I will skip the microstructure. This is just to say the uh, nano uh, particles, the silver nanoparticles, they're fused together. And then if you look at here, this will give you the consequence of the, of the processing technique. And uh, on the left-hand side is the thermal conductivity. So, these are represented by uh, the histograms, the different columns. And uh, the curves are for the uh, thermal efficiency enhancement. So uh, if we look at just uh, EP with only hexagonal boron nitride, these are the results. If we, use, if we look at uh, the, um, uh, uh, the, the, the edge aminated uh, boron nitride, that is, you uh, ball mill them, and then uh, in urea, you will get to the, the, uh, the, the, the uh, purple one, uh, sorry, the, the, the blue one. So these are the thermal conductivities. And then uh, this is after annealing and before annealing. So you can see that you can get pretty good uh, thermal conductivity above one if you were to go into here. All right? So so that says that you can certainly uh, achieve higher thermal conductivity and uh, by the, uh, this uh, so-called hybrid technique. Now, the mechanical properties are also revealed here to show that if you were to add uh, these um, uh, silver nanoparticles, fuse them with a, uh, uh, the uh, aminylated uh, uh, boron nitride sheets, that is this, 
versus this without just only having the hexagonal boron and elytri, you see the improvement in the mechanical properties. So that is another way that we can uh, achieve mechanical properties, thermal conductivities. Um, OK. Now, of course, we have not discussed about here viscosity issues. Can we actually process them? And this is a very important thing. If you, can, if you make this materials and you cannot process them, it's no good. So we look at that into the viscosity issue, which is, a, which is an, an, an interesting uh, issue. I remember many years ago uh, when we were trying to process uh, 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 multi-wall carbon nanotube into epoxy, it's very difficult when they are in solid form to try to actually make them uniformly disperse. Not, not, not easy. So we did try other techniques in those days, is to liquefy those carbon nanotubes. And the very simple thing, think, is to add this NX2 group there, which will actually make them behave liquid-like. But there is another technique that uh, Professor Xi, they, 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 they try, and that is to use uh, to, the CNT can be functionalized with ionic liquid. And the whole idea is that these more or less become a lubricant layer. Now, in fact, this kind of idea has been applied to tribology. For those people who are working on the wear and friction of uh, 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 carbon nanotubes, they actually apply this kind of technique, the IL technique, to wrap around the fiber, and then they get very good or very low wear, very low frictional coefficient. So, so this is one technique that they have tried. And if you look at this diagram, you will see that epo the, the red ones is epoxy and CNT. And then the, the, the green one is uh, with uh, the uh, functionalized with the ionic liquid. And you can see the lead effect is very obvious. So this is an eight weight percent of the, of the CNT loading. And you can see it drops from 21 to around about 7. So this is a good method, except that it's a little bit cumbersome. And you don't want to really prepare things like this, particularly when you talk about large scale up processes. OK. Now this is actually some interesting work. It is. I think only old guys like me can think about this kind of technique. It is not anything strikingly new, because the concept was run about in the 1990s uh, in um, uh, Delaware. Uh, this uh, was the company's name called that produced all the aramid fibers. Now, the idea is, is like this. If you have a fixed volume, of uh, fillers, like in this case, usually it's the spherical particles. Whether it is that big size or that small size, the theoretical compaction density, you can work it out when they are fully compacted. And this would be round about 0 0.65 or thereabouts, theoretically. Now there is a way you can actually increase the compaction. Again, this is common sense. That is, for the given volume fraction of the fillers, you break this volume, total volume fraction in two portions, small particles and large particles. In other words, you have a bimodal distribution. Now, what would you get? Now, this is large to small diameter is around about four. Now, you can see the compaction ratio is around about 0 0.2 and 3 between here. And that compaction is 0 0.7 something. Now, you can, you can certainly look at different diameters. Now, what is the consequence of this? We say that you have a, now, before I, I, I talk about the consequence, people who work in cement, 
concrete, you will know that you have large particles and small particles. A company in Denmark called Blue Circle Cement, many years ago in the 80s, were producing so-called new uh, cementitious materials. And the way they do it is, again, large uh, 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 particles. This can be break, uh, this can be stone or can be um, uh, 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 mortar. And then small ones, some very fine ones, can be sand. And then they all go into the gaps. So you have a more compacted material. And you get very good mechanical properties. But here we're not making, talking about mechanical properties. We are making use of the concept. If they're more compacted for a given volume fraction, that means they are more freer to, 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 to move because the free volume is bigger, right? Because they don't occupy that much volume for the given volume fraction. So you can imagine that this was a concept that was actually developed uh, into the 90s. And we just look at one of the old papers and find that this is certainly true. Now, this is important, but are they or are they not? So what we did here is essentially looking at this is the irregular shaped alumina and 50 volume percent. Uh, actually, these are, I have four sets of movies, but I thought I just saw the, the final result here. So this is pouring out, and then this is uh, all large, uh, XS is zero, so this is a, all large particles. This is, uh, uh, XS is one, that means all small particles, right? The one are big and what are small. Well, big is 30 micron, small is five. And you can buy this quite easily in the market. The irregular ones, the average size is about 12. OK. Now, you can see that here, this is all small. This is all large. Well, you can just look at these front material onto the disk. And you look at this, 20% small and 80% large particles, which is very smooth. So, this was a concept that was produced in the 1990s. So we thought that this is good. So we'll use this. Now, the main reason why we're trying to do this is that my former colleague, Brian Cottrell, doesn't believe in nanomaterials, doesn't believe in nanotechnology. They say it's all rubbish. <laughs> he said that if you can use micro fillers, which are much cheaper, why do you want to go to nano? So this is correct. So we tried that. We, we solved this problem first. Then the next thing we try is can we actually make this interface materials? But before we do that, we want to show you this is the irregular uh, uh, alumina. Alumina is cheap, anyway. This would be uh, DDS. This would be the one to, uh, with 20% uh, small. That means 5 micron, 25 volume percent, 5 micron. And uh, not 25%, not 50 per 2 is 10%. And then the rest would be 30 uh, micron uh, big size, which is this one. Right? You can see the small ones. They are all going to the gaps, so make them more compact. And uh, this one is actually uh, F. F is, uh, when it's upon, is, is a 30% small particles. So this one is not as good. But you can see the compaction that we are talking about. All right. Now, can we now satisfy the requirements for electronic packaging as an underfill? Now, here we are plotted. OK, let's see this. Uh, X S is 0. That means uh, they are all large particles. All large particles, that means this one. OK. Now. Uh, Xs is 1, that this is blue, that means it's here, it's this particle. Now, OK, Xs is 0.2, that is the triangle, blue is here. So you see that X has 20% small, 80% large particles. Your viscosity is really here. So you can actually satisfy the 20 
centipoids require for the capillary feeding process. And this is actually a plot of these at uh, a given uh, shear rate of one per second at room temperature. So these are the lowest part. So that means they do satisfy the flowability requirement. All right, what about the thermal uh, conductivity? You can see here that the last part is very high because the irregular alumina will touch each other. So therefore, it's bound to have a higher thermal conductivity. But our 0 0.2, 0 0.3, you'll be wrong here, it's about 1.4. So you do satisfy the requirements of thermal conductivity. Although the, uh, the, the, the simple model given by Lewis and Nielsen is, it, it, is this. But experimentally, this is what we get. Are they electrically insulating? Well, you just take an example of the pure epoxy first. These are the black squares. So this is here. Then any of the combination here, they are actually not far away from the epoxy. So meaning they are also electrically uh, insulating. So we satisfy that. What about the CTE? We, we say the requirement is around about 20, 30, thereabout. Now, before the TG, we look at the thermal expansion coefficient. During operation, before the TG is here. And this is around about 30. After the TG, uh, post TG, that means if you work on it, on it you know, switch on and off, and the temperature goes up, then you will reach about 40. So we more or less satisfy, I think, the requirement. Definitely, when it is cold or, or the temperature is not high, we do satisfy uh, the CTE requirement. OK. The dielectric laws and dielectric constant, this is much at one megahertz. Um, the uh, blue one is the dielectric laws, and uh, the black square is the dielectric constant. Epoxy is round about three to four. Round about three here we have uh, for epoxy. And of course, now this is a, a paradox, actually. In trying to get a material that will have actually a low dielectric laws and also low dielectric constant. Now you can achieve that with some of the work done by Wang Xinyu at Shanghai Shaojun University is to use a boronitride nanotube. He did that and so that you actually reduce it. It goes down but not go up. But here it's going up because you add this uh, alumina there and, uh, and they have a higher thermal well, the alumina yeah, at one. That means this is the dielectric constant of the alumina. So, uh, but however, these are the values that can be acceptable as a packaging uh, uh, underfill materials. So, all the mechanical properties is fine because when you look at the fractional strength, uh, 0 0.2 is round about here. Uh, fractional modulus is here. So, mechanical strength-wise is not an issue. Okay, so in principle, we think that this is a very cheap material. We can actually make the uh, packaging uh, 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 underfill very easily. So this is, I thought, and we thought that we had the solution now. A very cheap solution, don't go to, these are micron sizes, no need to go to nano uh, uh, graphene or carbon nanotube or this. Now there is another issue. A lot of us probably have not considered, and that is the thermo, the so-called fire security issue. Because this can catch fire, or they can, they, they can actually, I mean, uh, 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 the temperature can go so high up that you lose all your uh, stability, and this is no good. So what are the approaches that we did to solve this problem? Right? The fire risk issue, these are some of the things uh, we are uh, uh, approaching this in the last two years. And uh, so the traditional method is very simple. 
what you do is that a schematic is shown here, the matrix, and then you have a thermal conductive filler with a thermal conductive function. And then uh, this is the common approach. You just add some of these fire retardants, commercial retardants. There are many of these, LDH and uh, graphene or carbon nanotubes. You can, you can put it in. And uh, this is the first approach people have tried. And these are the alumina particles. And then they put it, uh, the magnesium hydroxide, and also the uh, 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 graphite uh, nanosheets. Now, if you look at the uh, so-called heat release rate, the heat release rate, if this is epoxy, you will see it catch fire around about uh, 50, 50 seconds. Not very good, of course. You get these fire retardants in, the commercial ones, and uh, this was the one that you, you, you add uh, the uh, GMP. Uh, the, this should be GMP. It should be the nanoplanets. And then the magnesium hydroxide right, and the alumina. So you move this uh, curve to, to, to here. So now you will take about uh, 250 seconds instead of 50 seconds to catch fire. So what this means is that you are now five more times for you know, evacuation or what, if you have a warning system attached to it. So uh, this is a very important requirement for all types of microelectronic devices now. OK, so this is the traditional uh, method. But there are other methods, which is, we call it uh, the, the synergy approach. You still have the. Uh, uh, fillers with thermal conductive functions. So this would be shown here. These are the thermally conductive fillers. And then you would have a so-called synergetic filler, which would then provide not only the conductive function, but also the fire resistance function. And the way to do is like this. If we started with silver nanowires, as we did in the previous slides I have shown to you, aggregation is a problem. If you do not you know, to, uh, code them with PVP and all this, they are clusters. It's no good. Now, if the, you have graphene, and now you actually functionalize it with a so-called branchonite frame retardant, they call it uh, DOPO, which is, uh, I don't know the full name, but it is a, a frame retardant polymer. And that can be functionalized with graphene. And then you put this into this uh, 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 epoxy and silver nanowires, now you've got much, much better uniform function. Now, as a result of that, then you can see that actually uh, these uh, graphene uh, uh, layer will actually form a char. And uh, you will see, well, they would not uh, have the wicking action so that fry will not spread. But this is the thermal conductivity. At 4 volume percent, you definitely satisfy all the requirements. Not talking about the silver uh, uh, nanowire alone, but you talk about uh, this uh, uh, with uh, the, uh, the functionalized graphene. So this is a technique that has been uh, used uh, by the Professor Xi, uh, I think it's uh, about last year. Now, of course, there are other problems I have not uh, mentioned yet, and that is what about the viscosity? Uh, because when you add something more, you got to be. There are other problems. So uh, it's not resolved, but we are only attempting to try to resolve the fire risk issue. Now, there is a third method, which is uh, we, we only published last year, and that is on the surface modification technique. On this surface modification technique, and uh, I think. I forgot to, to put the equation. I, I don't know really how to write XCCP. But it is a uh, fry retardant molecule, and that it is interacting with the graphene, uh, uh, the GO. Okay? And then uh, as, uh, uh, you will form a so-called GO XCCP. In other words, uh, what it means is that you have the alumina in the middle, and then uh, we, we do have uh, 
a graphene layer which is functionalized with this frame retarded. So it is more or less like the particle, and then I have the graphene, functionalized graphene layer, which has a fire retarding function. So that is what it did. Now, now I can control the layer, uh, the, this uh, uh, layer thickness relative to the alumina. And I can change it from about 70% uh, of these to 30, uh, or 50 to 10. I can vary the ratio so that I can get different fire resistance properties. So this was the, the idea. OK. <coughs> now, this is just a schematic to show what we just described. First is that you have the alumina, and then you coat with the geo, which has these uh, pre-treated with these uh, 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 fire retardant uh, 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 polymer. And then uh, that behaves like an ins a, a kind of a fire retardant shell formed from geo. And then uh, this will provide you with the flammability resistance. We can look at this. This is the one for the NIT EP. Now, of course, the other thing I should mention is that the area under the curve is actually the um, total amount of heat that is released. Okay? And uh, for this, uh, uh, say, oh, this 50 to 1 or 20 to 1 is meaning the amount of the alumina relative to the geo, OK? And uh, of course, 20 to 1 meaning that it's much thicker. So a much thicker layer, the uh, 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 initiation time is here. And the amount of heat release is much smaller, the area. OK? So, so this is the, 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 the method, uh, I think, to, uh, that was published only last year. So this is now. Working, we now we, we use alumina, but you will see that the volume that we use is quite large. So, 78 percent. So, in other words, you can publish, but it does not mean you can use it. It's difficult to use 70 percent, and uh, the viscosity will be too high. But anyway. We look at what actually happens. Now, this is what most people who do fire studies will do after the fire, which is one of the most common type of tests is the so-called cone calorimetry test. And the other two, one is the so-called ROI. Uh, the, the, uh, and then the other one is the U, 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 UL, VO, V1, something like that. OK, here is, a, is only a uh, calorimetry test. And uh, on this side, it's just, yeah, just with the alumina, nothing else. So you can see that this actually breaks up into bits. And uh, this is, this is the, 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 the mechanism, is that the particles just collapse. Now, if you look at this one, which is uh, blah, 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 with uh, a, a 50 to 1, that means the thinner shell. You can see the top one is a char formation. And you compare this with the one with a much thicker uh, a geo uh, shell, you can see it's quite good, the integration. OK. And the mechanism are shown here. And uh, here, it breaks up. But here, this provides the conducting path. The black one is the conducting path. So it's OK. So this sounds to be good. You can uh, have fire retardants. The only thing, as I say, is still the problem with the uh, throwability. 78% uh, you, you high. I mean, the last one, which I, I think I presented it earlier, and that has now been, been published. And uh, this is not to do with uh, interface materials alone. We are thinking of using this also of um, uh, 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 pads, you know, the conductive pads. And uh, this is a technique that is quite simple. Uh, what we did basically is to make use of the P arrangement of the, um, oh, OK. Well, there are a number of so-called techniques that are available to try to actually align all these conducting uh, 
uh, uh, fillers. And a very common technique is, of course, by very strong shearing action. So you align them. Or you use either a, a large, well, it does not have to be large, some reasonable uh, 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 amount of uh, magnetic field, maybe one or two uh, uh, Tesla, and they're all using an electric field. You can align them, but they have to be subject to uh, be able to be magnetized or uh, electrically uh, aligned. Then there are other, but well, ice template is a very common technique used now. LBL is also very common. Now what we are doing uh, is slightly different, but all in all, what we are trying to say here is that if, uh, if these fiber, these uh, uh, conductive fillers are all aligned, they are better than if they are oriented or randomly oriented. So how do we actually array achieve this alignment? I think that is the, the main thing. So we don't want this random structure. We want this to be aligned. Now, of course, we, we already mentioned there are many ways you can align them. But the simple way that actually uh, Professor Xu Xiaoli mentioned is the so-called evaporation-induced self-assembly techniques. And the whole idea is this. We have to make them also, because we are still thinking of underfield applications. So uh, we are thinking of conducting in the in-plane direction, but electrically still insulating. So what we are doing is actually to try to use this so-called uh, 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 cellular nanocrystals. And so you use that as an insulator. And uh, then to use them to force all the different layers of the graphene onto the plane. So you can see here is a schematic of how we do it. The yellow ones, the golden ones, are the uh, 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 cellulose nanocrystals. And then these uh, dark, blue, uh, dark color ones are the graphene. So, uh, so what, what we do basically is schematically shown here, is that you, you have all of this mixed up in, uh, I can't see here myself. Yeah, in a DMF, and then you let all these solvent evaporate out. As you evaporate, then they will settle down. As they settle down, then they will force the, uh, 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 the, the structures to form an alignment. So that's how we basically uh, achieve it. Now, the important thing is that you can make this into reasonably large sizes. And what is shown here is about 10 cm, and uh, this may be about uh, another 10 cm, so 10 by 10. And you can make a thick cylinder uh, like this shown here with about uh, a 4 millimeter height, and then uh, here might be about 2, uh, two to 5 uh, centimeter in, uh, in the outer uh, circumference. So this is an, a, a simple way that, uh, that I was able to, uh, to achieve. Now, and so we call it the fabrication technique with a highly aligned structure. And, uh, and, and, and basically, this is the first sketch we already saw in the previous slide. And then as evaporation occurs, then they will gradually settle down. And that, therefore, forms a structure with all the aligned uh, 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 graphene. So this is quite effective. OK. Now, what are then the properties that you can achieve? And uh, we simply use the, the, the we use different, there, there is actually some problems. I don't know whether you guys uh, have encountered, because we use different techniques to measure thermal conductivity. You can use the laser flash technique. You can use the hot wire technique. And I don't know if you find out sometimes they don't agree. They differ. And they don't know which number is correct. And uh, we still use the hot wire method with three different uh, reference plates, and then plot the deviation against the thermal conductivity of the of the of the conduct at uh, the reference plate and then to get to the zero in the sub, then we say. 
So, so these are the results reported like this, hot wire method. OK, now, the in-plane TC of the graphene uh, planet, uh, let me try to see. Yeah, this is the red one. So we have to look at the red curve. The red curve, now, bronze is around about 26 here. And this highest value we got is around about 25 at about 4 volume percent. So this is really very high indeed. So you get very high in-plane thermal conductivity. And uh, 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 if, you, if you don't use uh, GP, you can use reduced. Uh, this is not fully reduced GO, but it's reduced GO. And uh, we get around about maybe not yet 20. So it's still very high, right? So uh, we think this is a very uh, a good method that we can uh, produce aligned uh, 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 materials with very high uh, uh, thermal conductivity and very large size. And we have actually done this with uh, 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 boron nitride nano sheets. And uh, these are the similar dimensions. But the thermal conductivity we obtain is around about 10 instead of about 20 that we obtained uh, with uh, the um, uh, graphene uh, planets. Oh, OK. So really, I have described over the last five years the different methods that we try to make a packaging underfill material that would be cheap, that could satisfy all the conditions. Uh, we try different fancy techniques using lanofillers, coating, and uh, we try to use uh, hybridization. Uh, yes, you can achieve one way or the other, but you cannot seem to achieve everything together. Now, when it comes to scale up industry applications, the other important thing is cost. Now, you have to remember a manufacturer looks at this the unit cost is very ex important. So using alumina micro-sized particle by modal distribution, it seems to, to work. It's not fancy materials, but it seems to work. And it's reasonably cheap. Now, we are now doing some other things is on thermal pads. The last one is more or less along that direction. Now, when we talk about cost, it's interesting, but I don't think you have any civil engineers here. And we now try to use asphalt, you know, in the pavements. It's very good thermal conductivity, insulating material. And you can mix it with rubber. Jensen is not here, otherwise Jensen will tell me whether I'm right or wrong. You can form a co continuous structure if the weight percent is less than 8. In other words, the uh, uh, SBS and the asphalt, they can form a co continuous phase to give you good mechanical properties. Now, you want to make them insulating, well, they're already insulating anyway for the matrix. To make them thermally conducting, we add actually alumina there. We want to use the chip thing. So, as for the chip, and uh, an SBS is chip. And uh, so alumina is cheap. So we put them all in, and then uh, we actually can't control the thermal conductivity and electrically uh, 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 insulating. The only thing is, the viscosity is too high. So we cannot use it for underfill. But it would be good as a very inexpensive thermal pad material. So that is the latest work um, that uh, uh, we will uh, we are we 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 will probably publish next month or so. So uh, 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 other than science, sometimes we have to cons be concerned with engineering aspects. That so I think I have already summarized what we did, but there are still issues unless we are talking about uh, the, um, the, the 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 alumina by modal distribution. But for that. We have another problem we haven't resolved, and that is the thermal security, the fire risk. We have to add something there, but 
Anything you add there, you will increase the viscosity. So there's not fully satisfied. Now, there is also another issue, which I mentioned to, to Professor Kim. And I think is that with these 3D integrated structures, how are you going to actually join them together? Layer by layer, how do you join them? And this is simple, right? Even the simple things we have not resolved. So how are you doing with a with a with a three D vertical? Remember in that I'm not talking about we are still talking about chip packaging. We haven't gone into the three D vertical arrangement yet. So uh, I think with that I I will stop here and uh, thank you very much for taking to, uh, today. I think everybody should not work. <laughs> and uh, so you, you come here. I'm very grateful for that. And uh, thank you very much. If there are any questions, just ask me. Yeah, OK, thank you, Professor Mai, for a very inspiring talk. I think in the last um, uh, part of your talk, you talk about the aligned structures for thermal pads. Yes. And I, I see that you have achieved a very high thermal yes. conductivity. Yes. So you also use the cellulose nanocrystals. Yes. So can you further uh, elaborate how the cellulose nanocrystals can help in terms of the uh, structures oh. and the thermal conductivities? Well, the, the thermal conductivity of uh, cellulose uh, is not as high as these other uh, uh, graphene, of course, but it is electrically insulating. Uh, this is basically uh, the crystals, they are not like that, they're elongated. So they, as you, the solvents are being evaporated, they will settle down. And so it's by the natural action of that that you form a sediment, sedimentary structure. So that's how, how we do it, right? Mm. What is the matrix material you use for the for the last one? Yeah, the, for the last one. Uh, no, it's just just, just that. Just, just that. yeah. yeah. Oh, without just polymer. The, no, without polymer. Oh, no. okay, okay. No, no, no polymer. Uh, no polymer. No. Okay, so then just like the boron nitride, uh, Lando sheet is the same thing. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. So just uh, like uh, cellulose nanocrystal and yeah. the graphene. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. Actually, I, I myself, we, 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 I, I mentioned to you about this thermal conductivity, because I was uncertain, really. Uh, the number is too high to believe, to be honest. So we did a few times in Shanghai again to measure them using the laser flash method. There is some slight difference. So, uh, but of course, what can you do? You can only trust your student. <laughs> you use your common sense. And you know that, gee, this is too high. But then uh, we already spent two weeks in Shanghai again to measure them using different techniques. Uh, but they are still high. <laughs> so I don't know. I, don't, I really don't know. OK. Uh, Jin -bing. Jin -bing, Thank please. you, Professor Mayer, for your interesting <laughs> talk. Uh, for Dr. Shen's question, I'm also very interested in the alignment structure. So can you explain what is the uh, driving force for the alignment, self-alignment, and also Will the size of the graphene sheets affect the alignment degree? The degree oh, oh yes, yes, certainly. I haven't got the details here. Yes, of course. Uh, well, the, the, the whole idea is just you, you have your, <laughs> your graphene uh, sheets. So I can't remember what the size is now. And then do you have your uh, 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 cellulose, right? And then uh, you, 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 you put this all basically just drop casting onto maybe a, 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 a mold. And then uh, this is all in the solvent. So when the solvent evaporates, then they will naturally self-assemble. Self now, of course, it's not self-assemble. The force may, may not be as high as you would try to force them. So it's, a, it's naturally just when the solvents are gone, and then they will just self-align into that. And that, that is the way how the, but I can't tell you, I cannot remember what the size is. It is in the paper, so I have to, to look at that, right? Yeah. The, the thing what we are trying to do is to basically get large sheets so that we can make something. And uh, it seems that we can make up to about 10, 10 by 10 cm, which is quite large, yeah. Thank you, Professor Mai, for your um, interesting talk. Yeah, thank you. So, 
Um, I have a question also about this part of the work. Um, Cause I'm not very familiar with the underfill material, yeah. but as far as I can understand, is the um, the material should be first flowable, right? As yeah. according yeah. to the, yeah. the your the introduction. Yeah, flowability. Yes. Yeah. So um, does this work also related to the uh, the the f underfill material? Because uh, as far as I can understand, the uh, usually for the pre preformed pre structured filler. Um, usually, we make the composite by um, uh, uh, the f infiltrating the preformed structure after the the the, uh, the alignment, and so in that case, that means the the material itself is not flowable, which cannot be used in the underfill material. Um, another qu another question is about. Uh, um, uh, as you, as we can see in this work, the high thermal conductivity can be achieved in in-plane direction. Yeah. Um, however, for the cheap um, thermal conduction um, ambition, we need to, we doesn't we need the um, thermal conduction vertical yeah, vertically? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So can this material solve yeah. that problem? Oh no no not the way, not not the arrangement we did. Okay, I mean, there are two, two points. The first point is about flowability. I mean, certainly it is correct. You, you need to be able, as I explained, the gap between uh, the, uh, the chip and the substrate. And uh, most of the current underfill process is by capillary forces, drawing the resin. So that's why we say the uh, 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 viscosity uh, is around about 20 points or, or CPA, you call it. I call it centi points, one point. And now, uh, if you cannot, you know, uh, be lower than that viscosity, that means is you, you you are not able to, to 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 draw them in, just like unless you do suction, but you don't do that. This is for natural capillary pressure to draw them in. So the way we did in the first efforts has been always to make sure that the viscosity is lower than 20. That's why in many slides, I show you different material systems, uh, whether we can get the viscosity. And, uh, and uh, the alumina already said, by modal distribution, we can get the viscosity very easily by pouring of the, 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 uh, the, the suspension of the bimodal distributed alumina in uh, epoxy. So, so that is important. If you do not satisfy that, you will not be able to, to feel uh, uh, this. Now, of course, I mean, I was talking to one of your, no, he's not here, Wang ba Professor Wong, Wang Baoling. And uh, he actually uh, was able to make very highly thermally conductive, uh, highly drawn uh, polymers. Now, I, I knew about that type of thing. But then the problem is, they're thin film. How do you put it into the packaging? So you talk about this pre-formed uh, 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 material. You can't do it. You, ne you need to draw them into your assembly. So I think that is the, 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 the problem. OK, so we saw that we can do it with certain system, but not all the systems, right? So you need to satisfy all the requirements, as we say, right? And, uh, uh, and uh, we satisfy all the, the thermal conductivity, electrical insulation, the processing of viscosity, and dielectric laws, dielectric constant. We can satisfy those things with that setup. Now, the last question you were talking about is uh, the align, uh, huh? Oh, the, 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 the trans transverse direction. Now, of course, in this case, you can. You can. But you can certainly, I mean, Professor Kim would tell you how they do it. You can make a 3D structure, of course, right? You can, you can do it. Then there are many papers published in that. Yes, this is also another requirement uh, for many TIM materials. But you want conducting. You want them conducting what, electrically or thermally? It depends on the structure you have. For us, we don't want it to, because on the top is the, is the, is the chip. You don't want it to electrically heat it or thermally heat it. You want them to go this way, the best thing. Or you stop them from transmitting. 
All right. Electrical insulation is what we are worrying about here. So uh, yes, there are a lot of research going on. It's on the transverse uh, 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 thermal conductivity, electrical conductivity. And uh, 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 that can be done uh, by uh, tailoring the hybrid structures. You can do that with different types of feeders. All right. OK, any further comment or questions? If not, then let's thanks again Professor Ewing Mai for his interesting. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much.